traveled by California here in Monterey, getting ready for this conglomerate of fun at the Sea Otter Classic. Now, unless you've been living underneath a pebble beach, you know this is one of the biggest festivals to go to with something for every discipline. On top of that, there's riding, takes you up to the Fort Ord National Monument and the Monterey Bay. I'm already overwhelmed. Let's roll. The Sea Otter Classic began here in 1991 around this two and a quarter mile racetrack billed as the largest bicycle festival in the world. The closure in 1994 of the surrounding Ford Ord brought a massive amount of open space, allowing a number of racing options and camping setups too. The city of Monterey is part of the settings, known as the gateway to Central Coast beauty, friendly bikeways, and its significant history. While the fishing industry became well known by the likes of John Steinbeck, this was the land of the Costa Noan Rumson, with the Spanish Presidio placed in the middle of these lands in 1770, as Monterey became the capital of Alta California in 1804, and also for Mexico in 1822, but few know the Argentinian flag flew for six days in 1818 by Hippolyte Bouchard, who plundered the Pacific from the Philippines down the California coast. In 1849, delegates from across the state converged on Colton Hall to construct California's first constitution. Now thousands flock daily to Monterey for different reasons, as the aquarium is one of the top rated attractions in the world with an extension collection of underwater habitats, look but never touch life forms, and classic sea otters. Which brings us back to the festival, which takes a lot to navigate. Luckily, there's a bike valet, but every creature is allowed to ride around. And it feels like you're always 10 seconds away from someone doing a wheelie. General Mission parking seems to stretch to Oregon, which is why you'll see a lot of bikepacking options, as well as from the mobile home variety, maybe because they know we like exploring remote places, which is why learning about off-road navigation has caught my eye with my propensity of getting lost. Essentially, without cell reception, this is your device that can kind of two-way communicate without that. So gives you that reassurance. It's going to have some preloaded topoaptive maps. Um, it's going to offer, you know, notating um, private versus public roads, uh, depending on those, those areas. It goes without saying, there's a lot of bike talk here. And the good news is, if you have a favorite manufacturer, then everyone seems to have a gravel option or maybe even more. But buyer beware if they are in stock. Vic, is this the one that got away? This is the one that got away. I did a bad thing. I sold my bike before this was available. And then they raised the price $3,500. So that was really bad. I'm not a big gearhead, but at the Ridley booth, we were intrigued by their classified hub, which works as a two buy. It's uh, also, it's through inductive charging. Uh -huh. It drives a little motor inside. Well, it does look like motors inside of bikes have become a thing. In fact, there were a lot of e-gravel choices out there, as I'm happy to see them appear at our Send It rides. And you can really see the industry taking it seriously with options offering an incredible amount of travel range to ones you have to second guess about having a battery. And I love the riding possibilities of bulking up that come with it. It's either go big or go home. <laughs> yeah. I was also not shocked to find suspension options trending, as we'll continue to see improvements as the technology and weight improves. 
And while this may be the year of post droppers and suspension, expect more comfort in your headset soon. On top of the races, there are plenty of opportunities to ride. And I joined Flashpoint Movement's Amanda and Nehemiah with their ice cream social out of the Giro booth, where it was Grupo Compacto navigating the festival, where we cover about half of its La Gravilla course. The great thing about this wide open tarmac was that it made this social conversational. But that narrative changed hitting the single track, which offered great views of Fort Ord if you could look up long enough. This was the type of ride I was looking for. Even though the single track was a bit bumpy, the pace was right to casually ponder as the group laced the hillside with the grasslands in peak form. The fire roads were a nice contrast gracing the ridge lines while giving you the confidence to let it rip. But the majority of dirt was single track, which was fine for a group ride, but I was concerned with so much of it at the start of the race. Finding pavement felt like an anomaly, but served a purpose to get us to our ice cream faster, which was a perfect afternoon stack as we headed back to wrap up our Saturday at Sea Otter. Sam and I headed out early for La Gravilla, which you can delicately read the excitement in my face, as not only were the gravel and cross-country races using the same course, but strangely, they were starting only minutes apart and the downhill single track seemed too aggressive of a choice, even taking out Peter Stettner the day before, as staying in the back would mean getting overtaken by XC racers, while pushing at the front meant being around people pushing at the front. And while I was rationalizing this, we were off. Some thought the sand was cute, having wheels whip by your face, as staying upright was a challenge. Because who could have predicted this outcome in the middle of this mosh pit? Needless to say, I felt like I was aimlessly charging like a Braveheart battle. As we moved towards our exit from the tarmac, the ride bunched up again, where I went with my mostly predetermined decision to enjoy my morning in a different way. My plan was to stay on the fire roads, which brought me to crossing the race from time to time. And not that I figured I would have been at the front. I was happy to be away from these types of speeds because I might get trapped with the less skilled, but more likely vice versa. I'm sure I confuse some as a lost rider but I was enjoying the time alone, as maybe I wouldn't appreciate this beauty at race pace, so I definitely gobbled it up. I found my way back to the end of the race course, which you just had to listen for the cues where I would watch racers tinker up this last heavy climb for better or worse. And it provided for a lovely vantage point, even though I was crevasse fabulous, enjoying cheering on these riders. Oh yes, and even Sam. While I was inspiring watching the elation from everyone reaching the apex. Because spectating can be a sport as any bit of motivation has never hurt, no matter how many riders there were. As the line of riders bulked up, it was easy to pick Vic's smile out of the crowd, 
So I quickly made some tracks to hop on the bike and play catch up to enter the track with just a few final turns before finishing off whatever you want to call this. And with a few words to close out, this was enough of an experience to call it a sea otter. Am I glad that I came? Yes, but to quote Tyler Durden, you decide your own level of involvement. It can be a bit overwhelming, and I imagine every trip back is gonna be different, but this is a great area to ride, and it was a lot of fun to connect with the GBCers. So, if I'll return next year, I think you'll know why. Anyways, if you wanna see more wacky adventures like this, please hit the subscribe button, or support us so we could wander around just like this to bring you more from the State of Dirt.